Well, good afternoon and welcome to this ERCnet uh, webinar. My name is Francesco Emma and I'm speaking from my office in Rome. Um, as usual, before starting, let me remind you that your microphones are turned off, uh, but that during and after the webinar, you can send your question through the application that is on your screen. I will ask your question at the end of the presentation. The webinar will last approximately 30 minutes uh, we will then have uh, roughly 15 minutes available for questions. So our speaker today is uh, Beata Lipska uh, Jemcevic. Uh, Dr. Lipska uh, Jemcevic um, is a pediatric and a clinical geneticist. She's currently the head of the genetic clinic at the Cl Clinical University Center in Danza in Poland. She's a member of the Molecular Diagnostic Task Force for the European Rare Kidney Disease Reference Network, the ERCnet. And since 2011, she is the genetic coordinator of the Podonet registry, uh, which is obviously associated with ERCnet. In the past year, she performed and supervised more than 5,000 genetic tests for patients with various um, hereditary kidney disorder. She's the author of several publications on genotype-phenotype correlation in hereditary podocytopathies. And the title of her talk today is Schimke Immune Osseous Dysplasia. Uh, Beata, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Francesco, for the kind introduction. Uh, before we start the seminar, I would like to ask you a very simple question. Have you ever met a patient with a Shimke? So let me try to launch a poll on that. Okay. Um, I would like you to choose one of the four possible questions. Now, there's a difference between uh, A and B because I uh, make a difference between people who just take care of Shimke and those who actually discovered Shimke in their patient, because um, I think this is the uh, really uh, challenging to make this diagnosis. So this is why I made the special difference in the questions. Okay, so they are kind of mutually exclusive, but working. Okay, uh, let us just wait a little bit for the, uh, for the question, uh, for the results. Okay. So actually, uh, one fourth of you diagnosed a Shinke uh, disease, and and uh, almost uh, over half of you have already seen a Shinke patient. So now we ha having the setting. Let's let's start and let's see what um, what we can expect uh, in clinic. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, when you open a textbook, any textbook, you will find this uh, very basic information that uh, Shimke immune osseous dysplasia has a, uh, um, has a particular number in the OMIM registry of all Mendelian inheritance in man diseases. And definitely for you all, as you know, I'm a clinical genetist and not pediatric nephrologist. Uh, we, the genetists, we have our Bible. And this Bible is called a gene reviews. You have the logo here on, on the right. And in this book, you will find chapter on uh, uh, over 700 different genetic diseases and Shinke is there. So if you need any further reading regarding Shinke, I recommend you that this is the source. No, do not try Wikipedia, try gene reviews. Okay. And when you go uh, start reading, you will just get this information that is an autosomal recessive disorder. Um, and as in the names of the disease, it affects the immune system and it affects the skeletal system. So why are we talking about kidneys? This is uh, uh, soon to be elucidated. But before we go into kidneys, uh, let me just introduce two people. First, Professor Schinke from uh, Kansas Medical Center, um, who was the person uh, who described the syndrome uh, back in 1970. One and another very important uh, person for the for the patients with Shimke disease is uh, Dr. Verkel, working currently in Canada, who discovered gene and made the first genotype phenotype correlations. I will be referring to his work uh, a lot during today's talk. Uh, so, first of all, 
Shimka immunosis uh, dysplasia is caused by mutation in a single gene. It's a single gene monogenic disease. The gene is called SMALCON1, and it is the gene the, uh, that plays important role in DNA stabilization, and its deficiency leads to impairment of cellular functions due to progressive DNA damage. And Hence, our patients will have progressive systemic disease, systemic. So and a number of systems will be affected. Uh, what the protein encoded by the gene does, it has a helicase domain, and a helicase is a protein that attaches to double helix of DNA, as shown on the picture, and uh, separates the two, uh, uh, the two strands, pulling it apart, but also stabilize, uh, stabilize uh, the entire molecule. Although the helicase activity is well known, how um, this uh, malfunctioning to replication for caused by mutations in the gene um, lead, are leading to the specific phenotype of uh, Shimke are still elusive. The most important part of the protein is this helicase domain, and actually, uh, in our paper published two years ago, and also in the, in the largest registry of Shimka patient published so far, most of the patients will have mutations located actually in this domain as shown on the picture. And this helicase domain actually composes of two subdomains that wrap around the DNA molecule. DNA molecule is uh, some, uh, written here this double helix, I hope you recognize the, the double helix here on the structure. And here you recognize the yellow subdomain, C-terminal subdomain, and the uh, blue, uh, blue subdomain with ATPase activity. Uh, the mutations presented uh, in red can be located either here, either here, but I will refer to this uh, later in my talk, that particular localization of a given mutation has important effect on the phenotype of the patient okay so just keep it in the mind but of course the audience that we have today uh, is not um, patient uh, uh, are people who are dealing with progressive proteinodic glomerulopathy and actually this is what is missing in the name of the disease so uh, i understand all of you take care of patients with uh, nephrotic syndrome. So let's us try to make a second pool for you. Okay, let me just, uh, I would like to ask you another question. When you see a patient that has proteinuria, persistent proteinuria, in other words, when you see a patient that has a podocytopathy, what kind of genetic test are you going to perform? Okay, and let me just start it. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Sorry, I have some technical problems now, but let me just go with this. I think I will not be able to do this. So just to, uh, let's go directly to the question. Uh, there will be, uh, we have, in people with progressive protein and glomerulopathy, we, we can either do whole exome sequencing, we can do gene panel, or we can start with Sanger. And definitely, uh, we at the Podonet registry recommend that uh, patients should be screened with NGS-based large gene panel. Why is it so? Because it's fast, it's cheap, it provides good quality of reads, it's robust, and on the other hand, it has no incidental findings. This is why uh, it's better from whole genome sequencing that takes time, and it's much better from single gene testing that uh, is not robust and needs a lot of manual work. So if we apply this, uh, this uh, approach, we will detect Shimke disease among our patients presenting with persistent proteinuria. Actually, using uh, NGS approach is like searching a needle in a haystack because Shimke disease is presumed to be as rare as one in three million people. However, 
From our experience at uh, Euronomics, at the Podonet Registry, and from our American colleagues, we know that 1% of patients presenting with steroid-resistant nephrotic sy syndrome actually has underlying mutation in the SMARCAL1 gene, in other words, have the uh, Schinke disease. Uh, if we think worldwide, there is no particular ethnicity, there is no particular geographic region when Schinke disease is less or more prevalent. Of course, um, as always, we notice a few founder effects, as listen here. Um, one in Slavic population uh, that I deal with, another in Indian. However, it does not convert into increased frequency in Shinke in those populations. So let's start with classical or other words, syndromic forms of Shinke. I prepared for you a few scenarios, what you can expect in your clinic and when you should start thinking that it might be Shinke. So the first scenario for you is a four-year-old boy with multiple pigmented macules who is diagnosed with proteinuria during evaluation for short stature. And let's have a look on the picture of this patient. Uh, we notice that he is a short stature. He has very short neck, short track. He has this proper, uh, the, um, rather long extremities compared to the short troop. And what is already what should be striking for you is protruding abdomen, lumbar rondrosis, and kyphosis. Okay, and I hope you notice also the maculus on the trunk. 70% uh, of patients have additional dysmorphic features. Let's have a look on the face here. First of all, I would like you to see the triangular face, broad nasal tip, uh, nasal bridge, and bulbous nasal tip. When you uh, ask the patient to, uh, to examine his mouth, you will also notice in a majority of patients microdontia, hypodontia, or some malformant um, uh, um, teeth. Okay? So this patient is um, having clinical phenotype of Schinke. And the takeaway message for today's talk is this properly short statue as the cardinal feature of Schimke. And please notice that when we compare the short statue, which is actually a common finding in um, patients with uh, chronic renal disease, is that the, the difference is the, this disproportionate short statue. It means that the median leg length is significantly, uh, significantly uh, less reduced than the trunk length. So the trunk is shorter and the extremities remain at their state. When we follow up um, 34 patients in our cohort, we notice that not only at the time of diagnosis and uh, they were short statue, but over the uh, the age, with the uh, over the time, the the uh, the uh, the lack, uh, the short statue was getting more and more severe. So those patients are not growing over the time and it's becoming more apparent. So even if a diagnosis the height is okay, it will uh, deteriorate over the time. Okay? Uh, if you see such a patient with dysproporinous throat stations, I recommend that you order some x-rays looking for spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. What kind of x-rays you should do? I'm already referring you to a very nice review by Hunter uh, et al. in 2010. And the two x-rays that you should do is first of the vertebra, when you see the kyphosis and lordosis, and when you see that the vertebra have the pear shape, a P shape, that's one thing. The second thing, definitely you have to make an X ray of the hips. And uh, you will see signs of it uh, being dysplastic. Uh, there will be problem with the femoral epiphysis. There will be problem in the, uh, in the structure of the ilia. And most of all, there will be problem in the, uh, there will be malformation of acetabula. Okay, so these are the striking features. Some patients will have also uh, cellular torsica problems. However, the long bones will be basically normal. So you don't have to make the X-rays of extremities, neither upper nor lower. Another scenario for you 
Another patient that I would like to present today is a five-year-old girl hospitalized in status epilepticus. In the following and during this um, hospitalization, proteinuria was noted. Uh, in the following weeks, she had additional episodes of uh, seizures and eventually became triplegic with motor aphasia. So it is not epilepsy what is here, what the patient presents with, but with stroke, with um, either transistent cerebral ischemia or cerebral infarction. And definitely such a problems, problems to the brain occur in half of the patients, uh, starting with migraine-like headaches and getting more and more severe. Why is it so? Because there is a decreased elastin expression in vascular tissues, and therefore the patients have myointimal hyperplasia. I would like to, uh, to pay your attention to the fact that there will be ischemic, if, uh, ischemic uh, episodes in those patients, and also there will be hypertension as presented in this patient, and this hypertension can affect both the systemic but also pulmonary. And this is all due to uh, myointimal hyperplasia, which is uh, through decreased elastin expression. Okay? Also, those patients have uh, uh, immune dis uh, dysfunction that predisposes a patient to atherosclerosis. So those two features, both problem with the uh, vascular system and atherosclerosis, leads to strokes in a three, four or five-year-old children. Okay. Please note, however, that those patients are not intellectually disabled. Moderate cognitive impairment or mild developmental delay, delay occurs only in one-fifth of the patients and usually only after cerebral um, ischemia uh, episodes occur. So far, this person that we discuss here had normal neurological development. Another scenario for you is a patient with a history of recurrent infections. Let's have a look. Uh, in February, he had diarrhea and fungal UTI. In March, he developed sepsis and, and a very particular agent for sepsis because it's E. coli, later followed by bronchopneumonia and followed by diffuse intestinal pneumonia, pneumocystis, uh, cytomegalovirus, etc., etc. So we see a patient with problems with recurrent infections. We think about immune deficiency, of course, and this is the major finding in Shinke patients. T cell deficiency and um, uh, occurs as frequent as in 80%. There will be also leukopenia. There will be decreased uh, CD4 lymphocytes in those patients. And in that way, those patients will be prone to infections. Actually, infections are the leading cause of death in Shinke patients. Please also note that as in all other pa uh, patients with immunodeficiency affecting T, -cell, um, T cells, there is higher risk for lymphoproliferative disorders, for instance, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which occurs in uh, up to 5-10% of those patients. Last but not least, a scenario prepared for you uh, for today is a three-year-old girl with the history of intrauterine growth retardation. So, a very early onset of short statue, and neonatal transistent thrombocytopenia, who presented at three years old with nephrotic range proteinuria and hypertension. Okay, so we have ITP in the history of this patient. Another boy that I'm um, presenting here, who had some proteinuria since the age of two, now at the, at the moment of admission has ITP and anemia, uh, and both are uh, with the presence of um, direct anti antibodies. Yes, autoimmune diseases occur in one-fifth of patients with Shinke. It can be mostly hematological autoimmune uh, problems, uh, as severe as Evans syndrome, but also um, just anemia or just thrombocytopenia. Uh, there can be enteritis, and one of our patients had even acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, okay? So uh, also autoimmune uh, problems as in other people do have immunodeficiency, congenital immunodeficiency, okay? I think I convinced you that there is a number of possible uh, syndromic or systemic presentations of patients 
who uh, eventually would, will be diagnosed with small cal one uh, mutation. But with the advent of gene panel screening, as we perform it at Podonet, and definitely you perform it also back home, there is more and more cases that are uh, diagnosed with small cal one mutations and only uh, kidney only or renal limited phenotypes. So actually, we can, and here at Podonet, one third, one third, 30 percent of our patients were actually diagnosed with Schinke by incident, by uh, advanced incident. So those were appreciably idiopathic proteinuric glomerulative patients who came to our clinic and who were ordered um, a large gene panel testing, including SMARCAL1 gene. So what is the difference between the syndrome and those incidental cases uh, of SMARCAL1 mutations? Actually, the difference comes from overall survival. As you see, the survival of patients with syndromic form is very, very bad. And by the age of 10, more than half of them deceased compared to those who have incidental uh, finding and those are performing pretty well by the age of 20. There's almost 90% of them still alive. But surprisingly, what well, there is no difference regarding the cause of the renal disease. As you see, regardless whether those are the severe form or the moderate form, the cause of of renal disease is ultimately very, very poor. And by the age of 20, almost all patients who survive to this moment will require a renal replacement therapy. So what is the renal phenotype? Actually, renal disease occurs in 99% of Schimke patients reported so far. The missing 1% is a younger sibling diagnosed with SMARCA1 mutation who deceased due to a severe infection before developing kidney disease, actually. Okay? So when you look at the renal phenotype, please note that the, the, the cause of the disease is even more aggressive than in uh, podocinopathy related to NPSH2 mutation, so to podocine 2 mutation. Uh, those are the data from the Ponodent registry, and you see that the um, deterioration of kidney function in Podocin is roughly 50% uh, of patients with NPS2 uh, mutation will lose the kidney by the age of uh, function of the kidney by the age of uh, 13, while this occurs uh, significantly earlier for those that have mutation in SMARCAL1. The median age of diagnosis is less than five years. The median age on, at end-stage kidney disease is less than 10 years. Okay, what is the finding? If you perform biopsy, the dominant form uh, uh, will be focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, and some patients who had the biopsy performed very early in their disease will present with minimal change nephropathy. Please know also that only two sets of patients actually present with nephrotic range proteinuria. One in three will just have proteinuria. Those patients who do not present a nephrotic range proteinuria actually are the most severe forms of, uh, of Schimke because those are the patients that have severe uh, immune problems, etc. etc. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, having those patients, we would like to read more from the genes. So we would like to know whether there are any genotype phenotype correlations. Uh, roughly speaking, mutations can be divided in those that are missense types. So just um, a replacement of one amino acid with another one, or so-called truncating mutations. So those mutations that result in lack of protein produced. And uh, in most of the genetic disease, truncating mutations are severe, and this is actually what is observed also in Schimke patients. Surprisingly, however, regardless whether the patient has a missense or a truncating mutation, the cause of his kidney disease will be exactly the same. Okay. However, 
there are a lot of pitfalls to genotype phenotype correlations. So far, there are only uh, 100 patients worldwide with Shimke reported. Approximately half of them are compound heterozygous, so have one missense and one truncating mutation. Then it's very hard to classify those patients and to perform a, a straightforward correlation. Also, there will be uh, uh, the extraordinary symptoms that I already presented to you uh, emerge over time. So uh, it, uh, it's very hard to correlate uh, what patient has what. Yet, not only we know that truncating mutations are more severe and missions are moderate um, in the course of the disease, but we know also that particular, particular located mutations, even the missions, but located in the very ATPase catalytic subdomain. So in this blue part, this is exactly a very short area of the gene. So if you have a missense mutation, then the disease present in your patient will be still severe. On the other hand, surprisingly, the truncating mutations, which are located at the very, very end of the disease, of the, of the gene over here, as this result or in most of the protein being produced and only the tail is missing, those patients have relatively mild phenotype. Uh, this includes the common uh, Slavic European uh, GLU848 mutation. So what you should do if you diagnose a Shimke patient? Regardless whether you diagnose this patient with or without extra renal manifestations, you should take care of his skeletal problems, his renal disease. And here I, I made a few statements regarding treatment. Those patients eventually progress into end-stage kidney disease. In the literature, you will find some uh, reports on transistent reduction in the rate of renal disease progression, but this is only transistent. Those, all of those patients inevitably will end up requiring renal transplantation. Please note that those patients will be short. The treatment with growth hormone will not be of help for them. However, what is important for them is to take care of all the immune and hematology problems that they may meet. So you should, you should uh, treat neutropenia, uh, you should treat uh, and put them on the prophylactics for infections. You should prevent uh, ischemic, uh, ischemic events in the brain. And even you should try bone marrow transplantation in those patients. What about prevention? Of course, you should look out for secondary complications with proper protocols of vaccinations as in other T cell immunodeficiencies. And please note that life attenuated vaccinations are to be avoided, okay? Uh, you should put them on a certain um, prophylactic um, anti-infection drugs. As regards surveillance, even in patients with no extra manifestations today, those should be monitored for the skeletal problem, for the immune problems, hematological problems, and of course, the progression of kidney disease. As a takeaway uh, message of today's talk, I would like you all to remember, if you happen to have a steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome patient who is short, who is disproportionately short, has a short trunk, always consider Schinger, even if you think that it's just trying to find a, a needle in a high stack, this occurs. And we, with more and more, with more and more gene panel performed in our steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome cohort, we detect more of the, more of those patients and we can introduce uh, uh, yeah, early prevention of secondary complications of the syndrome. And in that way, uh, improve the final outcome of the patient. Thank you for attention of today and I'm already inviting you to the next webinar that will be heard on uh, May 21st. It will be by, uh, held by, uh, announced by Lutz Weber on primary therapy of steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking for the questions.
Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Beata. This was uh, really um, a very clear and very enlightening uh, uh, webinar. Um, so please um, um, send in your questions and I will read your question to Beata. We have one question from uh, Marina uh, Atsanova and um, she's writing you what is the prognosis of patient with syndromic forms of Schinke disease after hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, um, after renal transplantation, are there any um, 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 I think, are there any special conditioning uh, therapy for these patients and any special um, um, protocol for post-transplant management? Yes, thank you very much for this question, which is actually very, very difficult to answer. So far, uh, there is only ca uh, casual reports on bone marrow transplant in those patients. Less than 10, uh, 10 patients worldwide have been transplanted, and most of those patients uh, regrettably deceased uh, after the bone transplant due to um, infections. So uh, it's very hard to tell you what um, what will be the outcome. Uh, of course, we try to improve this with the new protocols. Regarding the uh, the post transplant uh, with uh, the conditioning therapy, we know that in patients with um, uh, with Schimke, we should try rather a moderate um, uh, protocols of immunosuppressions because those patients are uh, having immunodeficiency already. So uh, um, moderate doses would be better. But by the word moderate, I cannot give you exact doses because this depends from patient to patient uh, and a, uh, his syndromic forms. If we go back to my um, slides, I would like you to pay attention to the fact that uh, you should monitor those patients post-transplant for, um, for lymphoproliterative disease. And we had two patients who had actually epstein barr related lymphoproliterative um, uh, problems. And those patients deceased uh, uh, um, soon after diagnosis with, uh, with the lymphomas. And here it was really, really difficult to, uh, to tailor treatment for them because uh, the underlying genetic uh, defect in Schinke is DNA um, damage. So uh, cancer, uh, cancer treat uh, therapies based on um, like cyclosporine, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, should be uh, should be moderately um, uh, delivered to those patients. But because there's uh, really casu uh, casuistics. It's less than 10 patients worldwide. It's hard to, 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 to give some standard uh, line of uh, treatment for those patients. It's too early, I'm sorry. Yes, no, I, I personally agree with you and I would just say that um, we, 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 we performed two uh, bone marrow transplants and both of them actually didn't do well. And I suspect that there is an under-reporting because a uh, bias of under-reporting because um, many of these patients actually do not survive their, 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 these procedures and are not reported. So it, it, it really is a very, very, very severe disease. And, um, and um, there is another question for uh, Matthew Georgie. Uh, who's asking you whether you can be more specific on the post-transplant immunosuppression? Unfortunately, no. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say so, but as um, uh, Francesco already introduced me, I'm a clinical genetist and pediatrician, but I'm not uh, the patient, take uh, the doctor taking care of in post-plant uh, plant uh, units. So I don't uh, feel an expert here. On the precise doses, etc. Et Francesco, could you could you be of help? Yes, no, no, well, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer this question. Um, no, I think that there is really not um, enough expertise. Uh, but clearly, these patients have an underlying immune defect. Um, so the question here: whether you're trying to treat these patients with a combined uh, kidney and bone marrow transplantation and the issue here is always which one do you do first and it often depends on 
on, on, on what is your renal function at the time that you consider the bone marrow transplantation. Most of these patients are diagnosed after they have already developed kidney disease, and they can also progress relatively quickly, as you clearly showed in your presentation. So it's a very complicated question. The other thing is that um, um, the bone marrow transplantation uh, will cure, um, at least theoretically, the defect of your immune uh, deficiency. But as you very nicely said, um, the defect is not just in the bone marrow and in the kidney, it's a more generalized defect. And um, for example, um, you will probably not treat the endothelial dysfunction of these patients, um, which may actually be the cause of their, their, their vascular disease. Um, and we need to be aware of this. Uh, also, there are I... pulmonary problems that occur over the time. I didn't uh, uh, mention yeah. that too much, but also the older patients start to have restrictive uh, pulmonary disease and the respiratory problems, which is another syndromic fall. Also, the disease is progressive because there is a progressive DNA damage. So uh, the whole system of DNA repair in those patients is not working. So we can presume that there will be, uh, with our treatment, if we sustain their, um, uh, those patients, uh, our treatment will also lead to a uh, higher rate of cancer, for instance, in those patients, as observed in our immune deficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. So those patients are, are really affected with a syndromic disease, even if they manifest as kidneys only. That's so, right. so yes, and 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 again, uh, uh, Matthew Georgi uh, is asking if whether there is a role for antiplatelet platelets anticoagulant therapy, because these patients have a vascular risk. Um, would you like to say something about this? Uh, yes, actually this is, um, well, uh, to date there is no curative or effective long-term therapies. However, a number of people were trying mentoxifilin, uh, aspirin, uh, warfarin, heparin uh, for, uh, in those patients, but usually just, uh, you know, like for a few uh, weeks, months around the TIA episodes. Uh, but uh, the to date, uh, I couldn't find any trial reporting on a, a, a successful long-term therapies, uh, unfortunately. Yes, and, and Larissa uh, Prikodina um, asked you uh, exactly the same question um, on antithrombotic treatment. Um, and I think you answered the question. I think that indeed we are lacking data on large cohort because it's such a rare disease. Um, and um, and it's hard to say more than than this. Um, all right, and um, and actually, I would have asked you the same question to tell you the truth. Um, so I think that there are no more questions. Um, and um, so I'd like to thank you, Beata, for this very nice uh, webinar. I think we've learned a lot, and you were very clear. Um, and um, we, we understand better the disease, um, and thank you very much. And, uh, and goodbye to all of you, and, um, and again, we invite you to the next uh, uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again, and thank you. Have a nice afternoon. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.